the early 20th century in London, there lived a group of extraordinary people, people like the writer, uh, Virginia Woolf, the economist, John Maynard Keynes, and they were the part of an incredible set of people called the Bloomsberries. Well, now we're going to find out in a new show here in San Francisco whether or not Virginia Woolf can dance. We're here with Jenny McAllister, Artistic Director of 13th Floor Dance Theater. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, can Virginia Woolf dance? She sure can. <laughs> Tell me about it. At least in my piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, this piece is a combination of dance and theater, so if you come see the show, you will see um, sort of like a play with movement that enhances the, the, the storyline. Um, and Virginia Woolf does dance. She has a beautiful duet with her lover, Vita Sackville West, sort of showing the tenderness and a little bit of playfulness between the two of them. Yeah. And uh, she does dance in the larger context of the piece as well. Yeah. Now let's back up a little bit. For those people who may not be familiar with the Bloomsberries, unlike thee and me who clearly have been fascinated by them Obsessed. for a long time. <laughs> Obsessed. I think that's a good word for the Bloomsberries. Who were the Bloomsberries? Um, it was a group of artists, writers, economists, psychologists, really fascinating group of people who would meet in a then unfashionable neighborhood in London called the Bloomsbury neighborhood, mm -hmm. where many of them lived. And they would get together to mainly to talk about their art and what and life and love and sex and have these great conversations that created a lot of the aesthetics and um, a lot of art views and writing views that we that have carried forward even into today. John Maynard Keyes, his economies, his econ his economic yeah. uh, tenants are still in place in many places. Right, and of course, today. in Virginia Woolf, I mean, even uh, last year, there's a local nonprofit here that I'm involved with, the Rainbow Honor Walk, honoring heroes and heroines in the LGBT community. Virginia Woolf one of the first people on the walk. She's usually on the top of and, many Well, and also because a lot of people don't realize that uh, she was very modern. She was very open about her bisexuality. She was, and um, she the, the relationship that I'm choosing to represent in this particular evening is uh -huh. with Vita Sackville West, was who she wrote, or Orlando, the novel was basically a love letter to, to Vita, and um, you know, it was the story of somebody changing from a man into a woman mm -hmm. throughout this sort of weird time travel thing. Right. So it's a really interesting novel and um, she got the idea from her relationship with Vita. So so when did you become, as you say, obsessed with the Bloomsbury? Actually way why? back in high school I was so interested in just the different art, the different artistic uh, sensibilities, the idea of this group of people living in this sort of bohemian way very ahead of their time and the, it sort of seemed to me at the time like a very idyllic society. As I've read more and more about it, of course, everything's not perfect. But I was just so fascinated by this idea of complete acceptance mm -hmm. within a group on top of all this great intellect and, right. and art that was and, happening. And we are talking about what, what period, what was the kind of uh, the utopia uh, of... Uh, the Bloomsbury's, what time period? It was mainly the, the time period surrounding World War I. Mm -hmm. That was when many of them met around in the early 1900s at Trinity College and then the, the group sort of grew out from there. So they've, um, they actually, many of them remained friends all the way up until into their 90s. So it carried forth and their children became part of the group and moved on and carried it forward. So, so it really was an attempt at a utopian period. society. Yeah. Talk to me about the, you said they're not all in your play. There's uh, not room. <laughs> not room. But talk to us about the, 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 the ones that people consider the major Bloomsbury's. Who are they? And uh, why are they important to us? Virginia Woolf definitely you know, main feminist writer, very ahead of her time, speaking out for women and women's rights back when there wasn't much of a voice for that. Um, Lytton Strachey was another writer who um, was openly gay at the time, very openly gay mm -hmm. in a really wonderful way. And very, um, he wrote a book that sort of tore down a lot of Victorian sensibilities of the time, Florence Nightingale and Queen Victoria, mm -hmm. and people who had been held up in this very strict Victorian way and how wonderful they were, and he sort of sardonically tore them down in this novel, Eminent Victorians. So those are two of the, the people I was the most fascinated with, and they were considered sort of the leaders of the, mm -hmm. of the group. Um, how important do you think Virginia Woolf's legacy is still? Oh, it's very important. I, um, I mean, I remember reading To the Lighthouse the first time, and it, I think I've reread it twice since. I have, and Orlando is actually one of my favorite books, and even though that's not, you know, overtly speaking out 
about women's rights, it, but it is underneath the, the idea of this man turning into a woman and then he basically loses all of his rights. He loses his property, he loses his social standing because he turns into a woman, but it's sort of humorously done and um, and that's actually been sort of a, a great influence on the work that I do. I try and insert humor whenever I can. I think mm -hmm. humor can bring poignant situations actually into a greater light. Well, it's interesting. The Bloomsburys have a reputation of being this kind of uber intellectual sect, uh, and they were, but humor was very much a part of Yes, they, they were, were very funny. If you read many of the, especially Lytton Strachey was, I mean, what a character. He was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And this sort of mean, biting wit on his part and Virginia and her sister Vanessa all would sort of like to tease people to, um, mm -hmm. you know, get them to come out and discuss things a little more, <laughs> right. uh, rile them a little bit. Yeah. Now, are there any descendants still around? You say, you know, they, they became a multi-generational uh, Bloomsbury. There are still, um, I can't remember her name, but Roger Fry's daughter, I believe, is still mm -hmm. alive. Um, and many grandchildren, I not even many of the children have since passed on right. since then. But As part of your research into this piece, have you tried to be in contact with them? You know, that just occurred to me that that would have been an interesting thing to do. <laughs> but I tend still to... Still time. There is still time. I, I tend to... Um, I tend to like to take my ideas from sort of almost a fantasy place. And so I went, you know, I read a lot about the group and then I sort of thought, well, what would I do if I was taking these characters and moving them around? Right. And there's almost too much information, as you know, <laughs> about these characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's only so many angles I can That's right. The Bloomsberries attack. must have a small yeah. bloom, not exactly. like a whole bouquet. So tell us about this piece. It's called Bloomsbury. Is it real? Correct? It's called Bloomsbury. It's not real. It's not real. I apologize. But I saw the question mark at the end. Is that correct? Um, I, don't, I don't think we... Maybe well, I there's always a question mark. Got it. <laughs> where, where, where did you get the idea for this? And how do you, as you say, there's a lot of material. How do you convey the essence of Bloomsbury in a, what, 90-minute, two-hour dance theater piece? Probably closer to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was interesting, I had the idea for the Bloomsbury group and I was thinking about how they are this microcosm, or they were at the time this microcosm of society and all around them, you know, this was just 20 years or less after the Oscar Wilde trials mm -hmm. and it was very, you know, yeah, dangerous talking about these things was not safe. Right, and you had to be careful and being in the upper strata of society protected you a little bit, but not completely and so was, I was interested in the idea of this insulated society and then I was thinking, well, how far have we really come today and I was thinking about things that I, I found sort of distasteful about our society today and I thought about reality shows which we all watch but are I don't kind know of I've never horrible, seen one yeah me neither a horrible yeah <laughs> sort of can't look away car accident kind of a thing mm -hmm. and I was thinking how can I sort of is there any way I can connect these two really disparate but things? But you know, the Bloomsbury's might have been in a reality show. Well, the, I mean, they were a reality show. They, they went, were. It wasn't like they I were know. having this little life and talks about sexuality and art and not inviting people in. I mean, you're right. Linton Strachey was like, you know. Come he, on in. <laughs> he was about as out as you could be, yes. it, whether it was 1912 or 2012. Yeah, and it was very, I, so what helped me with sort of the catalyst of this piece was leading a reading about Lady Adeline Morell, who was a patron of the arts, who would invite them all to her home, and they would play these sort of weird little parlor games, and she was very good at creating a guest list, and then the next time eliminating people because she didn't think they were going to be the next big thing. <laughs> and she would also grab people and pull them off into a little room to pull these things out of them, like, oh, and, and was that really true that you like him, and, and pulling uh -huh. these things out. And I thought, oh my God, she's a reality show hostess. Yes. <laughs> and so <laughs> we've made, I've structured the piece a little bit like a reality show. And you know, there's sort of the talking head interviews, we have it, but it's a reality show in 1922, so there's no yes. television camera. Right. We have the spotlight coming on for the talking heads and people are sort of surprised. They have to sort of say something and Adeline pulling them off to the side. And then of course, I mean, this group is just rife with drama. And that's what everybody loves about the reality shows. What's happening between What's all happening the characters. Yeah. And so um, I've sort of structured, used that as a loose structure and the writer that I'm working in has thrown in some subtle reality show right. references. So. Um, 
that's sort of how the piece came about. <laughs> right, and it's going to be performed at ODC Theater in that's San right. Francisco, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, right. the name of your uh, collective is called 13th Floor Dance Theater. That's right. Tell me why and what other sort of work do you do in our last few moments? I love the idea of the 13th floor because most buildings don't have yeah. one. I'm a very superstitious person, but in a little flip-flop way, I like the number 13, things that are supposed to be unlucky. I'm sort of drawn to, I want to turn it around. Mm -hmm. So that's where the 13th floor came from. And we do work that is uh, described as darkly humorous and um, making the dance world a funnier, less ponderous place. Was oh, so you think the dance world may be a little bit of a ponderous place. That's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. I like seeing some ponderous work, but I think it's nice to have also some humor as well. And I'm not the only one in San Francisco that's doing it, but I think it's a great thing to you know, to bring a little humor, as I said, to contrast the right. poignancy. And you get to choreograph Virginia Woolf. Yeah, who, who could ask for more? Who could ask for more? Thank you so much for watching. We look forward to learning more about the Bloomsberries and seeing Virginia Woolf dance. And we're glad you tuned in to watch 10%. I'm David Perry. We'll see you next week.